Hi there, podcast fans. I'm Mina Rizuki, a late sub for Tom Gibbs. Welcome to Telegraph Audio Football Club. Today, where else can we start but the Manchester Derby? An excellent performance from Ole's side, in particular the superb Marcus Rashford. Is it all over for City's title race? It's time to declare Leicester City as the real title challengers to Liverpool as they brush aside Aston Villa. Plus, Duncan Ferguson masterminds a win for Everton, Sari and Ancelotti falter in Italy, and Salt Campbell fields a team of aliens. Well, sort of. Let's take you into the audio recording facility where I'm joined by Jeremy Wilson. Hello, Jeremy. How are you? Hello, I'm good, thank you. Nice to have you back on. JJ Bull, you're part of the furniture now. Yes. What, was I not before? <laughs> you... What's happened? Well, thank you for coming back because I feel like we're, you know, this is a rotating cast and you're one of the constants that we can hold on to. Other yes. than, of course, me, who's really good about this because even when I'm sick, I'm here. And making his debut is Daniel Sekiri. Hello, how are you? Hello, Mina. Very well, thank you. Have Just I pronounced a... that right? You have, yeah. Okay. It's much better than what I get most of the time. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What did you get most of the time? Yeah, I've, tell I've, us. I've had all sorts. I've had Zebedee. I've had Z- what? <laughs> Zebedee as in the Magic Roundabout character. No, I had that yeah. once, yeah. Z- but in all seriousness? They yeah, are? I had oh, that dear. once. Uh, Zaquiri, I've had a few times. Um, yeah. What about Zachiri? I think Zachiri is technically how you're supposed to say it. Oh, is it? Not, yes. Uh, Albanian waitress told me once. I got her to check, handed her my driving license, said, can you, can you actually tell me once and for all? How, how you say it, and she said Zakiri, but I don't mind Zakiri. You are also yeah. the sort of on the sports desk known as Jordan Zakiri. Yes, after the um, yeah. Yeah, thick, thick carved Liverpool player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> we start with the Manchester derby, and sadly, we start on a horrible note. There was alleged racism in the stands. Um, were you surprised? I don't think you can. I'm, I'm never really surprised by things that ran, not random, but horrible events that can happen in the stand or on social media because my sort of uh, expectation of what could happen isn't particularly high. I, I don't think it's sort of representative of everybody, but no, I wasn't completely surprised and clearly the, the person needs to be dealt with and banned. I think the wider point I'd like to make is that I feel like football, sometimes when these things happen, it, we, we go down the road of calling, sort of talking about the societal issue, which obviously that's, that is an element of it. But I think for football, it's really important that they deal with the issue that they've got themselves. And I think it, it really goes down to gra- the grassroots level as well. We see a lot of these high, we see these high profile incidents, but at grassroots level, I think there's a real problem here that I don't think is being really grasped by the football association. And, I think that if you can't, if you're not tackling and dealing with incidents at that level, I think that it can filter everywhere. So I think that's, I think you can only deal with what you're responsible for. And I think that's where the FA, I don't think with their sort of disciplinary processes, we've done, I've done sort of quite a lot of talking to grassroots clubs about this. And it is an issue at that level. And I think you deal with what you can deal with. And I don't think there, it's being dealt with very well and there's not much confidence in the sort of disciplinary procedures around that. And uh, I think there's a lot that goes on outside the cameras as well. And I think that's somewhere where football can make a difference. And I think where you can deal with it, I think you, there's an absolute responsibility to be much stronger about it. And I think, the, I think where the FA could make the most obvious difference is to really deal with their procedures at the, that lower level of, of football. Sorry to go off on a bit of a tangent about no, it, but that's... I think that's I think that's the sort of point that I've I've sort of wanted to make for a while, and something that's really come across in some of the stuff we've done in the paper yeah. when we've looked at looked at this issue a bit deeper down. We've had this um, in Italy, and the problem is is that what you find a lot of the time is at least in Italy is the ultras end up using sort of the club and threatening them, being like, "Give this to us, or we'll do this, and then you get fined." Um, it's not as if they're fans at all. But let's talk about the actual game because it was thrilling in many ways, uh, largely because I think nobody... And it's strange to think that considering how well United have done in the big matches um, against against Spurs, against Chelsea at the start of the season, do they raise their games against the bigger sides? Is it because they don't have to do anything other than really counterattack at pace? It's a little bit of 
a uh, little bit they raise a the game a bit and they seem more up for it it's also a lot because they have a better midfield in that game um, so Lingard and McTominay and Fred is much better than Fred and Andreas Pereira that's just instantly a lot better of a team and there's also a stat that I dug out where Man United do not win if they have the majority of the ball so when they play against smaller teams they tend to have over 50% of possession so it's up to them to try and open up a defence when they play against a team like City who are going to have more of the ball because they're, I mean, they're probably a better team but then they are set off it and they can counter-attack and all the movement is really quick and the balls go direct up the pitch through the lines and they're able to create that way so they create in transition rather than with the ball and again it, like against City the, what is the, the stat uh, City had 72% of possession and it seems to be that the less of the ball Man United have the better the results and the more of the ball they have, the worse. Yeah. So if you want to see them lose, just give them a ball and be like, do something. Genuinely, that is seems to be like, that would be the weird maths way of doing it. But that doesn't really make sense because you can't just kick the ball <laughs> away. And, yeah. and be like, have fun. Marcus Rashford. Now he is ah oh, one of my favourite players. And there was a time when they were like, ooh, is Marcus Rashford? What's happening to him at the start of the season? I argued at the time that he didn't have Paul Pogba. He, they didn't have Martial either. Martial either. But now he's back to his best. He's undoubtedly improved his end product. Could this be down to Ole Solskjaer or was it the, the team in general? I think it is the style of the team that is a big a big factor. JJ touched on it that it's obviously a counter-attacking team. And in those sort of games when I think you really find out about teams when the emphasis is on them to win the game. And I think when there's a little bit less pressure... That's at the moment suiting Manchester United when they're not expected and they can they can react and, and counterattack, as we said. And I think that suits Marcus Rashford as well. And I think the the type of personality that Solskjaer is, he does if 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 he's, I mean, I have quite deep questions about whether he's he's was the right choice for Manchester United. I think he was a bad choice for to to at that time to, as permanent manager. But I think what he he does have is he does seem to be popular with the younger players and he does seem to have a good track record for um, nurturing and developing and quite a modern sort of style for um, in terms almost a sort of you know, he was good good with the younger players um, at Manchester United before there's players in Norway that he, Haaland in Norway who he's helped develop and he does seem to be good at that and maybe that's maybe perhaps that's his that that's perhaps his, his best role really is Maybe as a sort of frontline first team manager, I'd still have doubts. But that, in terms of his skill set, that does seem to be something that he's good at, is just sort of connecting with and managing young people. I don't think Rashford was physically fit earlier in the season. Oh. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we take that into account often enough when a player's playing badly. So often there is a problem that's not really been made public and he, he just looks look so much better in himself. I think he always benefits from when Martial's in the team with him. I don't think either of them are particularly dominant characters who like sort of playing up there on their own. But yeah. I think together they like sort of sharing and combining. Um, Do you think there's another level to reach when Pogba comes back in? Possibly. That's an interesting one. I mean, Pogba should help them against the bottom half teams when they have a little bit more of the ball. Uh, I think where Rashford's concerned, you know, I think he's got to improve when the ball's out wide and how he attacks crosses uh, and sort of passes, lateral passes. He's great running through straight at goal, but when the ball's out wide, he's sometimes a bit static or he stands on his heels too much, doesn't get across the near post, which is where, you know, Ferguson always used to say that's where strikers score their goals. I'd say he's more of a winger still than a poacher. It's yeah. just not quite yeah. developed there yet. Yeah. 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 Now let's let's go on and talk about City because I think that a lot, a lot has been said about, obviously, they're not having a season um, by their own standards that is really memorable. A lot of defensive problems. Is this really down to the fact that, um, permit me, I'm going to have an opinion on this when I have a chance. What is it? Is it the style of play makes it difficult defensively? Or is it the fact that they didn't really find a substitution sort of for, for Vince and company to bring in someone over the summer and then they lost Laporte, so it's just bad luck? It's the players that they have. I mean, they, so the, like Benjamin Mendy, since he's come back from uh, injury, is clearly not the same player. He's that seems to have really done him in a bit, and hopefully he can come back. But he's clearly not there. They've missed Sinchenko the whole time. Angelino, I'm not convinced about. Fernandinho's having to play at centre back. He's doing okay, but he's not the right option. Laporte would obviously be the one you want there. Otamendi's still not got Guardiola's trust. John Stones looks all out of sorts, and I don't think Kyle Walker is the player he was a couple of years ago either. So, if you look at, I mean, if you compare it to something like Liverpool, if Liverpool were to lose Van Dijk, Laporte, and then uh, Matip was 
all over the place and Lovren's making mistakes all the time. And then he lost Robertson and then Alexander-Arnold suffered drop of form. Straight away, that's yeah, four that's huge true. players that are gone and gone missing. Um, I really like Rodri or Rodrigo, whatever we're supposed to call him now. Uh, but he's maybe not as mobile as Fernandinho is. So when you put Fernandinho in the midfield, you get a bit more of a bite there. Whereas uh, Rodrigo's good at controlling and linking things. I think he'll be a good player in time. But then players like David Silva aren't quite on form and you're not as lethal going forward. You're weaker at the back as a result as well. And I think it's especially that company point, yeah, that's huge. Missing this and that from the from the dressing room is must be enormous. I think when standing or novice defenders play, their first instinct is to always take five five steps back to just to be that bit deeper. And that creates so much more space for the midfielders to cover. And City have not got the athletes in that part of the pitch to play that way. There are some teams who can play sort of fast and loose with distances and leave people one-on-one -on -one all over the pitch. But they, they absolutely cannot. They're just like Barcelona under Guardiola. Like they're all about distances. They have to, to defend well. They have to be tight yeah. as a team together. And actually, the second half, it helped that United were sitting on a two-goal lead. But they kind of sorted that out when the centre-backs pushed up to the halfway line, squeezed in mm -hmm. to the other team's half, and they looked a lot better then. Okay, so I'm asking you, say they had, um, you know, it's, it's funny because a lot of the time what you get with Man City is that they say it's such a well-drilled unit and, and all the players, you know, possess the soldier mentality, something that Zlatan used to sort of make fun of at, in Barcelona when he was a player there and obviously fell out with Pep. Um, do you think it is the soldier mentality that sometimes you do need a man like company, you know, you need these leaders at various parts of the of the field to be like, okay, we're going to, I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to take this on, I'm going to take on the brunt and try to do something special. And right now that could be what what's missing. Oh, yeah, almost certainly. Like Puyol at, at Barcelona is must be huge because all the kind of players you'd have otherwise aren't that same sort of character. It's massive. I think that there was a, quite an interesting book about it. It's called The Captain Class, I think it was called, by Sam Walker. I might have got his name slightly wrong. I think that's right. But he did a, a really interesting book about the greatest sports teams in history. And it was like, what was the common thread? And uh, you would expect it to be a manager. You'd expect it to be maybe an exceptional group of players, a Messi figure or someone like that, or a Michael Jordan. And it was actually an identifiable um, captain personality inside the dresser, dressing room stroke locker room. So it's quite interesting to apply that, what you were saying to Vincent Company, and think, where is that? And if you actually go through the great Premier League teams, you know, a Roy Keane, a John Terry, you can instantly say that was the one. And he certainly found, and this was looking at teams in football and then NFL, basketball, and every one might have been a little bit, some in, in places a bit skewed to kind of meet that rule, but... It was quite impressive. And Puel was mentioned in his Barcelona yeah. study and it was quite striking how, and I think it's something as journalists, we don't, we always so focused on managers or star players and it's actually a, a, a sort of captain who's not necessarily a star player or is actually positively very rarely the star player, but is this sort of personality who embodies the club and he's often the person or she that's pulling that that group of players in in a certain direction towards success and and just how key a thread they can be so i think that's really interesting with this manchester city example it's why you've seen a lot of clubs when they're trying to um go from one year to another like manchester united especially that's a big thing they lost all those all their players like yeah. schools gigs out out the way and that changes everything in the dressing room arsenal have got it right now it's their big problem but i mean if you look at the way that klopp's built his liverpool team he signed leaders that like the way they've scouted and found is really smart that Robertson is captain of Scotland. You've got Van Dijk is basically a captain, isn't he, on there? And you've got um, Jordan Henderson is a captain. All these players and Milner's on the bench and around it. All these players are really important and they set standards and it, it lifts everyone up. But City, I think, you get different kind of leaders as well. You get technical leaders and like vocal ones and there's, there's other ones I can't remember because I've not studied the full psychology of it. But, like, <laughs> David Silva would be a leader and he wears the captain's armband, but then is he really going to drive you on the same way you need when you're trying to dig in? Like it's, about having, it's about having different voices in mm. the dressing room, doesn't yeah. it? It just adds to this idea that after three or four years, players get a little bit sick of Guardiola shouting at them all the time and telling them the same thing over and over again. I think when someone like companies in the dressing room, Guardiola, certain Can half times and you know, pre-match talks. He can basically sit down and let his company, you know, take the team talk. And I mean, Guardiola uh, and used to never speak. go into the dressing room before games. He yeah. says that he just let that's the players' time. And if there's a void of that, then the manager has to speak all the time. Well, uh, he could do what Unai Emery did and just bring in the kit man, and then you know. It, well, exactly. Yeah, mm. well, we've seen that with Pochettino. You know, players 
um, you know, getting bored of the same message. But that's and, also why Pep keeps refreshing the squad, right? So they don't get bored of the message. Isn't that the whole point? He's trying to. Maybe he'd like to refresh it more than he has yeah, been able to. I think he wanted a big change. I think, and he, he, I think he does it. now. I, yeah. think there's a, I think there's a relentlessness of the Premier League point as well. And I just think that the Champions League probably psychologically is more is more suited to Manchester City this season. I mean, only one team, I'm pretty sure, have won the Premier League three times in a row. And, it, and that was Manchester United, which were very relentless at that time. And I think it's just hard, especially so, Liverpool. The, Liverpool, the Premier League is everything to them at the moment. And they're, they're probably less, they, they would not prioritise Europe, I, I suspect, in the second half of next season if they had to, because it's such a big thing for the City and team. And I just think for Manchester City to go again in that, that competition is, is, is tough. It's a motivational and I think that's thing. A, I think that's an obvious part of the equation as well. I'm not sure how that defence is going to hold up against better European teams. But let's move on to a happier note in the sense that Big Duncan has come to the rescue. Uh, Matt, as Matt Law was sort of, we were talking about this last week. It was really interesting that this happened. Um, you know, he's now in charge. There's such a feel-good factor around Everton. Tell me, JJ, how did they beat Chelsea? Uh, Duncan Ferguson came in and got all the players all right riled up. They started really aggressively, changed the shape to it was like a it was a four two three one, but kind of a four four two and a four two four at times. It's, um, it just worked against Chelsea, who also don't really have a midfield. <laughs> so I mean, it made perfect what? sense. Well, Chelsea just have they leave loads of space at the back. They, everyone goes forward, and then there's a massive gap oh, from them to the mm. defense. They're a bit mm. more direct. Everton won. They like turn Chelsea around. They it was pass it around very, the back as much. Yeah, it reminds of a very old channels. school Premier League. Like tactics, like proper 90s, get it forward yeah. quickly. Don't mess about this, this, all this fancy stuff. There's more than one way to win a football game. I think it'll work a lot. That sort of football will work a lot where you just get it forward and you you're, you um, are aggressive and you've got strikers heading the ball in the back of the net. But the goals they scored were really scrappy and they were a lot of mistakes by Chelsea defenders, yeah. who especially Christensen. Um, and I don't know of... I, I, I want to see. I mean, you can't write this off. Maybe it'll work for a while, but I suspect. I mean, there's a reason that Premier League teams stopped playing that sort of style and went to a more tippy tappy possession thing, which is this now seems to be a rejection of that. And there's this change in style amongst a lot of teams where they just go forward and they play in a more, I would call it, English way, where you just get it up the pitch, quite Sunday league But it works with great players. But there'll be a natural way to get around it, which will be keeping the ball again. I think it's a good opportunity for him because, I, personally, I don't think Everton were that bad under Marco Silva in general, in their yeah. general play. No, I don't. Honestly, I, Evertonians who watch them at home to Sheffield United and Norwich might disagree. I didn't see those games, those <laughs> three, Saturday three o'clock games. Mm -hmm. But when, whenever I watch them in like big games, they're general, in general play, they're pretty good. Um, at Liverpool, you know, they could have scored three or four goals. Uh, Drew the Spurs... Very nearly got a point at Leicester. Um, they've got a decent squad. Uh, I think what they missed was a problem with all Marco Silva's teams. They conceded loads from set pieces. So that's a load of small like details, marginals going against you in games constantly. But I didn't. I, I never watched them and thought they were a broken team. They were maybe missing, you know, little refinements in certain areas. But you know, I, I don't think. They were ever completely, uh, you know, broken as some teams get at the end of a manager's. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. I, I see what you're saying. I just think the one thing I think is weird about Everton. This is not very poetic, but I think under Silva, they just lacked a bit of, they just like balls, like just mm. something like, like ah, get into yeah, it. which they have now. <laughs> and a connection, yeah. They don't something. Really know what uh, maybe they can work together. But then the <laughs> thing is, Ferguson, he he's like one of those leaders that we're talking about, and he's has this natural charisma that just grows. And I think players will look up to him and know they don't want to do anything wrong by him because yeah, he doesn't deserve it. <laughs> like he has the potential to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> And I think, I mean that literally. But he just looks happy and passionate and that spreads to the players. That definitely passes down. But that will change if the results don't go the way they're supposed to very quickly. Mm. But you look at, I mean, these kind of, this exact was a bit lazy, but that kind of profile of, of man, like a working class Glaswegian who plays quite simple football, make sure the players know what they're supposed to do very quickly. He was talking to his players all the way through. You hear him shouting at Alex Awobi right from the start. They pull him around. Like, kind of like Alex Ferguson kind of stuff they were doing. It was really simple, like a 4-4-1-1 basically all the way through. 
Uh, I, w- I would like it if Duncan Ferguson was good. It has well, a- I mean, at least keep him for the next few games, right? It has a real power, that underdog mentality, that kind yes. of story these clubs tell themselves. But it's quite difficult to keep up if you spend $150 million each summer. <laughs> yeah. You know, they could do it under David Moyes when yeah. they were on a shoestring, and it was us against the world, you know, kicking against, you know, the big teams. But if they're spending as much as anybody else... It's a bit difficult to keep that up in the longer term. Especially when you're watching what Leicester's doing. But let's talk about Chelsea. Everyone, you know, it's been a fairy tale story because of the fact they obviously had the transfer ban, investing in youth, a lot of individual mistakes. But now the ban has been lifted and they can invest. I don't know if they necessarily need to. We looked at the back, the back line, there were problems there, but Rudik is there to come back um, and he is for me a, on another, like a much better level from what they have. But, you know, do they need to be careful about, you know, just splashing the cash over the... I think it's a real balancing act. They've got. I mean, the obvious thing is to sort of slightly sit on the fence and you say they they invest strategically and sparingly and where they need to. Where should you know, they invest? You wouldn't, you wouldn't say don't invest anything and you wouldn't say sort of kick out all the young players as well. So I think it's I think it's probably is that. Um, the, guy, the other guys would probably have a better uh, sort of tactical... Feel for where, but not it sure strikes, that's fair on yourself. It, you know it what strikes mean? me that the centre back and left back. Well, I, I would say left back because mm. that's I mean, they looked at Ben Chilwell apparently and a couple of others, but they, they, like I Minasin, mean, they've got Rodriguez to come back and you can't take his place away. And Zuma and Tomori are being developed, so you can't really take a place from them away either. I think it's part of a project. Mm. Um, right. right backs, the full backs, right backs, maybe fine. if Reese James could move inside to centre back eventually. No, he's uh, definitely a full back. Do you think? Yeah, I think he's definitely he loves getting forward. I think he's he's a tidy player, um, James. Then I think what, uh, what was the other one I was going to say? A, a forward because Giroud's not really cutting it, and then Giroud go. They want backup for Abraham. They've exactly, got a problem yeah. with the, goal, we're talking about problem with the goalkeeper as well, Kepa, no. because they're locked in to him. You know, seventy million pound long term contract. I think he's been you know, he's been a real weak link this season for them. He's been terrible with his feet. Uh, gave the ball away. Uh, was it third goal? Yeah, he passed Everton. it. Yeah, not the first. Put Zuma in trouble. That. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I don't he think should have been punished for what he did to Sam. I think the days yeah. of Chelsea like going, they're, they're not, then even, even with the transfer ban lifted, and even though they'll still be one of the more wealthy and probably active players in the transfer market, they're, 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 they're no longer in the Manchester City, Manchester United type category quite. They, they, they sort of moved away from that sort of race a few, a few years ago, even without the transfer ban. So I think if they get it right, they've got the. Because you can't underestimate what they've done. Their their youth setup's incredible. Their record in the domestic and European tournaments. So if they can get that blend right, but they have to they have to protect that. They have to sort of yeah. almost prioritise that because their their set academy setup is an incredible and inc- incredible. It's taken a while to come through, but that was always the case, and that's the thing that they've been ridiculed for it. But how smart does it look now that we invested in mm. getting people out on load and that a link with Vitesse now. Yeah, but it's, it's a shame that you had to wait for this to all happen before these kids were given that chance. But then they need time to be ready to play. If you put them in too early, they're not ready. It's that you have to put it... You can't take them out of the oven if they're not cooked. <laughs> like, <laughs> they, they have to be ready to play. They've all been loaned, haven't they? They've I've, all played games and you're more likely to get games in places like Holland or in lower leagues. I mean, look at Abraham last season was scoring heaps of goals and now suddenly he's ready to play Premier League level. The good thing they got, I think on the back of Jeremy's point, is that because they've got this team coming through and it is a project, they can now afford to invest heavily in individuals who will improve the entire quality of the first team, especially. So they look like... If they've now got that much money to spend and they can go, we will pay the 80 million for Jaden Sancho, that's suddenly them a bit stronger in the right and it seems better as a result. Hello, football fans. My name's Danny Boyle and I'm The Telegraph's Commuter Editions editor, which means it's my job to provide you with great journalism that makes your journey to and from work as enjoyable as possible. I can't prevent train delays or guarantee you won't get caught in the rain, but I can make sure you're up to date with the best of The Telegraph every morning and evening. My colleague Chris Price and I produce briefings to bring you up to speed in just two minutes at both ends of the day. Now, they're also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Just search The Briefing or follow the link in the show notes to this episode. Right, OK, we do have to keep moving on. Um, Villa, Leicester. One goal by Villa, four by Leicester. I mean, question marks all over the place about Villa's defending. Is this one of the reasons why they find themselves in 17th place? I think 
they have a strong spine, like we've said before, but they don't have the strongest team. Also, Leicester are absolutely flying. And uh, Darren Fletcher took this apart really well in match of the day too, pointing out that um, Rodgers is changing his shape a bit, a bit now and again to tweak to who he's playing against. And he went for a diamond here, which then meant you had Ihenacho and Vardy playing 1v1 with their two centre-backs. And um, Dean Smith didn't change anything during the game, just fine. But in the first goal they let in was Tyron Mings was injured. Yeah, and couldn't, yeah I'm uh, trying. It's a whole bunch of stuff. But uh, Leicester had them dominate in the middle of the pitch. And uh, that's where Aston Villa are strongest. So how how do you negate Jack Grealish and John McGinn? You outnumber them in that part of the pitch and suddenly they're not as good a team. It makes perfect sense the way he did it. Or did I mean, Brendan Rodgers is looking like he's one of the most astonishingly intelligent uh, coaches we have. In he community. is. Maybe he was all along and we were all just he was, very yeah. unfair. He always <laughs> was. Yeah. He always was. Now, he signed a long-term deal at Leicester. Do you think he's there for the long haul? Or do you think he might take up a job in Arsenal somewhere else? <laughs> I don't think he's there for the long haul. No, I think he would go if someone made him an offer. But whether uh, other clubs, namely Arsenal, would pay what will now be a pretty extortionate um, get-out yeah. clause in the, in his new contract uh, remains to be seen. But I think I think his ego uh, is uh, too big to turn down one of the established big clubs. I think he'd absolutely love that that idea of. Um, Rehabilitating a sort of fallen, fallen giant a little bit. But he really bought into that at Liverpool, didn't he? You know, all the mm. what, what a great institution this is, and the heritage, and who I'm following, and you know, running around the streets selling people's, smelling people's mints cooking, or whatever that quote was that he, <laughs> he gave. You know, these are my people, and I think he'd really like that. So. The, con- the contract is it's basically buying a bit of quiet for a, a, a period of time. It's sort of buying the not getting asked that question, buying, uh, uh, not having that distraction for the rest of the season. That's basically what it is. And from Leicester's point of view, it's great because it will put up. You, and sometimes, the, I don't know the details of this contract, but it's sort of, remember the Pellegrini one at Manchester City? Suddenly he'd signed a new contract when everybody kind of knew. Yeah, I was talking about... Was, mm. And it was basically to shut the media up and stop the distraction for that particular season even though and then the detail of the contract there may have been break clauses and different things and different yeah, we clauses don't know about those, compensation yeah. so I don't know the detail of that but I suspect that the priority of this contract and from Brendan Rogers' point of view he wants to make sure he has a successful season and he doesn't want it to get derailed by distraction so he was happy to go along with it perhaps with some clauses that we don't know about and the club obviously were happy because it would help from the compensation so I suspect if someone comes he'll, he'll be uh, he'll well, still be it, as it, ambitious and well, keen well it hasn't really worked because we're still discussing it right we're supposed to shut yeah. the media if they're on. in the Champions League group stages though you know to slightly yeah. argue against myself it'd be a, it'd be a tough Tough situation to well, walk away. I mean, it's Leicester a great team. Investing and they've got yeah. There's no with the Premier League now with the with the way the 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 broadcast revenues are so much more important than your sort of old school attendance. You know, your, yeah. your stadium revenues. It's uh, it's the, the the margins of moving to a club with a bigger ground and all the rest of it are, are less anyway. Right. Let's move on. Meanwhile, Liverpool. Obviously, they are the team to beat. Comfortable win. But uh, did they really need to be at their best against Bournemouth? Uh, You've got to feel sorry for Bournemouth they, at the moment, yeah. right? They rarely seem to have to be at their best against Bournemouth. I think they're seventeen nil up on aggregate oh, over dear. the last five games or something. Um, Bournemouth are uh, actually going under the radar in all the wrong ways at the moment. They're really struggling, and I think Eddie Howe is kind of looking a little bit institutionalised there. But Liverpool are just. The, the really encouraging thing for Liverpool in the last week, I think, is that they've rotated. Two or three players have come out, two or three players back in, and the level of performance has stayed exactly the same. I remember the game at United earlier in the season when Salah was injured mm. uh, and they, Origi had to come in, Mane went to the right. It completely disrupted the balance and fluidity of the whole team. And I thought to myself that day, if they, if they get two or three injuries, um, they could be in trouble because they look so finely balanced and reliant on key individuals. Whereas now, you know, Allison's been in and out, Fabinho's now out. Uh, he's he's now rotating the front three, which never happened, or very rarely, last season or the season before that. So that's the really encouraging sign. They can, I mean, they won against Barcelona with Origi. It, this is yeah. the this is what you have to sort of look at, the fact that the system is so good that it doesn't matter what they change in it, really. Um, but I, I want to talk more about Bournemouth, um, because can Eddie Howe really get out of this mess? 
Yeah, he. Would, I'm pretty confident that he. I'm not saying that he's. That I've, what Dan Daniel says is really about his position at the moment and it, and how long he's been there and this sort of keep reinventing yourself and keep, as Pochettino ran into a wall eventually and Hedy Howe's been there uh, longer and it's 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 difficult. It's I think it's hard for him and I think a lot of jobs whether he he's not he's never really looked like he's angling to move but the, the jobs haven't he, he hasn't had he hasn't moved he hasn't had an opportunity to go but I have huge faith in his sort of coaching and every season Bournemouth have been in the Premier League they've had these horror horrible runs and then and then they seem to sort of click out of it and go on a on another really good run and seem to to and they win games because they play quite open they score goals yeah, generally think, they, they generally get enough wins I think wins. he's tried to tweak that a little bit this season because they had a run of there was like clean sheets a couple yeah. of nil nils and a one nil the one nil loss at Arsenal where they weren't conceding too much but had stopped scoring all of a sudden so they've kind of lost a little bit of their I think he'll figure it out place, I think I'm confident that he'll figure it out yeah mm. the, the Bournemouth is level out every single year and he's kept in the league for however many seasons now and their team never reads like a great one. I think he knows what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. What about uh, Sun's goal? Would you say that that was certainly the goal of the week? My God, I was just like, this is such Mourinho football as well. There were so many of those, you know, direct 10, 11 seconds, you know, route to goal. But Sun's goal was something really special. Turns out running is quite useful in football. You just run like <laughs> Sissoko scored again. I like know. Running from it's so hard to defend against if someone's running at you with pace because you've got to adjust everything. Mm. Like, I don't know how much you're coached to have someone running directly towards you and how, how you then change your the shape and transition to all the different bits. I actually thought Harry Kane's goal was. Like, I was more like, whoa, what? Really, more than Suns. Well, Suns was exciting because you, you're going, but you, those sorts of goals are funny because then you see the players going for it, they're not going in properly for the tackle because they're not going to chop them out, and then suddenly he's through. I was like, oh, that was good. Whereas Keynes was just out of nowhere. What, like the technique on it to smash it over the keeper from that far? Yeah, the technique on that was exceptional. Like, I think if I was fast, I could do Sun's goal, but I couldn't do Keynes. <laughs> um, it's funny, actually, because when, when uh, Mourinho was at uh, Real Madrid, he stood there with a the uh, stopwatch and he would time how long it would take them to just run through the pitch and get the goal. And he was like, right, we've got to get this down to like 13 seconds, basically. And that kind of looks like what is happening there. Um, what about Burnley? They, you know, what's going on with them? It seems to be getting from bad to worse, really, at the moment. They're always paired together, aren't they, Eddie Howe and Sean Dyche? And I know, a little bit, yeah. We're going re- to repeat ourselves here that they always seem to hit a bit of a rut for five or six games in the middle of the season uh, and then Find come out the other then. side of it. Uh, it wasn't really supposed to happen this season because uh, there was no no Europa League. I think that, that, that kind was of the disrupted point. them last season. Uh, so they were meant to be a bit more solid and they were really, really good in the early weeks of the season uh, and mixing things up a little bit. They were stepping onto teams and pressing a lot more than they have done. Um, but they just, they look like they're struggling a little bit physically now. And I just think the, the level of players that they have and the amount of money they invest, they'll always, against one of those top six teams, they'll always probably have a, a bad day once a season where they just get completely outclassed. And uh, Newcastle are in 10th. Their form is super impressive. Everyone's like, oh, Benitez, who? What, what's changed for them? I mean, St. Maximan got at least a goal, JJ. <laughs> yeah, he scored. He's got a good leap on him. I don't think anything's changed in Newcastle. They're still playing exactly the same way. It's just very difficult to play against a team who sits with 5-4-1 behind the ball and then launches at you with absolutely rapid pace. I am yet to be convinced that St. Maximan is this amazing player that everyone says. He's really fun to watch. I agree with like, you. He's so much fun to watch, but I don't think he ever passes the ball. And it, so there's, there's a certain point like where he will he will get Newcastle to score goals by the way that he plays, but also he might they might score more without him in the team. If this makes sense. So although they'll he'll sprint and take on three players. Um, I don't think the teams double up on him yet. They just he just runs into where players are and then finds a way through. Sometimes maybe takes them up the pitch, and it's very useful. But without end product, he's basically a rugby player that takes them up the pitch and they win territory. I don't know, I can't, I can't figure him out. But New, uh, Newcastle, uh, Andy Carroll came on for Joe Ellington and that made a bit of a difference. This kind of, what you bring this huge energy and intensity to a game because he just fits that Newcastle side quite well. They're all right, but they'll level out. I think they're exactly the same. They're going to be exactly the same in the season as 
Like Aston Villa, West Ham, Bournemouth, Burnley, Brighton, they're all much of a such. God, like, pessimism all over. I just think there's teams that are okay. They'll win some, they'll lose some. It doesn't make them a bad manager. Like Bruce is not a bad manager if they suddenly lose three in a row, nor is he an incredible one for getting them where they are just now. It's just doing things very well and managing the team that they've got. Chris Wilder is a great manager, but we shan't talk. About, we won't talk about him. But rather, Wolves Brighton was another fairly fun game. A league is quite te- uh, deep with teams you'd like to watch. Actually, quite a good contrast because Brighton uh, now much more possession. Roll it out from the goalkeeper, three at the back, uh, keep the ball a lot more. And Wolves are a lot more direct, a lot more vertical, counter-attacking side. Um, both have been, had the better of Arsenal recently at the Emirates. Um, so. I personally, Wolves, I think I, I find Wolves quite exciting to watch. They kind of tailed off in the second half, energy levels dropped, uh, I thought. Although I, th- I think possibly now Graham Potter, if you think about managers, uh, where they might move next, possibly Potter has a style and an idea that might be easier to transplant into a, a top six team than... And when Nuno he goes Spir- to Arsenal, Nuno, it'll probably work quite well. Nuno Espirito, <laughs> Nuno Espirito Santo, possibly. Yeah. Uh, kind of um, slightly more possession-based, front-footed. I approach. think it's that we were saying earlier. I reckon there's so many of these fun games to watch because a lot of managers are sort they're not rejecting the idea that you have to keep the ball to win, but it's just so much more end to end and it's all about running. And uh, if both teams aren't just colliding in the middle of the pitch, they're either sitting deep and then pushing forward, it makes you get far more entertainment out of the game. You will not win anything in Europe doing that because mm-hmm. that's not how they play it in other leagues. It's just mm-hmm. I mean it's a different sport basically in La Liga. <laughs> it, 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 everyone tries to keep the ball. But it's way more fun to watch. And There's I, no pressure on these fixtures either, are there, for either <laughs> team, really? No. Because they're not going to get in the top four and they're probably not going to be relegated. And certainly, even if they get dragged towards the you know, the bottom three, there's there's so much time left. So uh, I think that's what makes the games that bit more open. There's no fear uh, from either side. Ah, oh, fear. It's something we cling on to in Italy. And it's time for a song for Europe. Okay, this is the part of the pod in which I interview myself, but um, I am actually going to come to you guys first because Russia, this is the big story, has been banned from the World Cup and from sporting events uh, for a few years. You know, there are they obviously can appeal. What is this about? It's a, it's a long-running story. It's something that will probably be subject to further appeals, but WADA have announced today that they're upholding the ban against Russia because they didn't sufficiently um, cooperate with, with with their inquiry into this doping that's that's been going on for, for or inquiry into it that's been going on for many years. And the 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 ban that's been proposed goes against Russia as an as an entity. So athletes that are uh, can't can't compete in international competition under the flag of Russia in individual sports, providing they've got a clean doping record, then there, there would still be the possibility for athletes to compete under um, some other flag. type of flag. Yes, mm. so it would have a, a potentially have a huge impact in football. Oh, Except in the Euros, which, of course, typically for Scotland, with the one time that they might get a, a little uh, buy through to the European Championships, it's not going to apply to that. Apparently. Tell me about Celtic. I know you've been dying to JJ. Speaking of Scotland, mm. no, I just think it was it's uh, it was obviously a big win for Celtic on uh, on Sunday at Hamden. They beat uh, Rangers one nil despite being against it the entire time. That is now ten trophies in a row. And I know it's it seems like it's this uh, one sided club. It's it's ridiculous how Celtic have been able to to sustain this. And I think it will come to an end at some point soon. Rangers should probably have won this. Steven Gerrard's not done anything wrong. It's his players on the pitch that just weren't able to get over the line with it. But that's a... So Brendan Rodgers set this... I mean, they were already in motion before Rodgers came in, but he won... Well, he won seven trophies in a row, and it would have been nine had he stayed. I would have suspected Neil Lennon took over, and it's just continued again. It's... Uh, I can't think of a level of dominance of it in the game. It's bit, and not in Scotland that I can think of. I mean, they're on course for 10 league wins in a row... I think there's I think they're on eight now, I think. Might be seven. Should get that they sound right. like Juventus. Well, it's a bit like that, yeah. <laughs> but all these eras come to an end at some point. I know, and it might it? just be for UV this season. Um they obviously suffered their first loss of the season in all competitions, whether that be in Europe or in the league, and that was against Lazio, who are on a fine win uh running streak of themselves, having won seven in a row now. They defeated Juventus three one. 
Juve did lose a man to a red card. A lot of talk of whether or not Sadi's up to the task, but it's so early to judge. It's only week 15, and it was the first ever loss for them this season, so let's not be too harsh on it. Ronaldo played a little bit, bit, a little bit better, but Juve not really looking like a side that can win the Champions League, which is, of course, the only trophy they really do care about. Inter, on the other hand... They're really determined with Conte at the top. Now, Napoli haven't won in nine games. The pressure is seriously building on Ancelotti. Uh, There's a lot of talk about where he might go next and talk of the fact that PSG wouldn't mind having him. It's also because Bayern are looking for a coach and they would like Tuchel from PSG. So there'll be some musical chairs, all of them rotating at the very top. But for Napoli, I think what the onus is, is that right now they're struggling to score goals. So they're better in Europe because they can rely a little bit more on defending against the better teams and then doing something special when they have a chance. But when they are given the ball in Italy and and been told to, you know, go and have fun. There's a lot of fear at the moment they're playing with and it's a psychological fear and it seems like they just can't get over the line at the moment. Everything becomes a problem. And frankly speaking, I just think that if they had someone like Mauro Icardi rather than a Fernando Llorente and, you know, still relying on Dries Mertens and Lorenzo Insigne, I think it's there needs to be a refreshing of that squad and they need to bring in a guy's that are a little bit more clinical, um, someone similar to Dries Mertens. Um, as for Bayern, they're also in seventh. They've got Hansi Flick, uh, their interim coach. They lost to Munchen Gladbach, which was, um, I think it's a shock because what you see with Bayern a lot of the time is that they seem to be dominating matches and they're creating lots of opportunities. And they're not really, they collapse in certain moments. They'll have defensive flaws a lot of the time, but you just look at them and think you need to finish these chances because your squad is better. You are creating more than all the other sides and you're just wasting all these opportunities to collect points. It's going to be difficult now. I wonder whether it is Tuchel. There's also um, Eric Tan Hag from uh, Ajax potentially coming in. As for PSG, we know all all their front three scored against Montpellier in a 3-1 win. But I want to ask you guys whether this will be the season where they will actually do it in Europe. I think they've got a really good chance. Do you? Yeah, Do you feel that way every season, though? Uh, I, d- <laughs> I did last season, yeah. Not the seasons before that. Okay. I think, I think uh, the midfield is a little bit more pragmatic now, isn't it? With um, uh, Idrissa Gay mm-hmm. uh, in there. I think it's a bit more balanced. Um, and they, they they battered Man United over two legs last year in those two games. It was a complete f- freak result that United got through. Um, so I don't think they need to be too disheartened uh, by that, even though... Yeah, defensively, sometimes in the, in those key knockout games, they've kind of had these these horrible fifteen twenty minute spells, and they were um, yeah they they ship two or three goals when the pressure really comes on. But yeah, I think they've got a good uh, certainly as good a chance as any of the so called big European teams. Um, than yeah, Real Madrid, Barcelona are just a complete one man team at the moment. Um, you think Real Juventus. Madrid are? Uh, I well, actually think Real Madrid could win it. I know that. I know that's how well, they've done this. But they've done this before, haven't they? Where they write off basically the La Liga season, mm. where they're miles behind, and <laughs> that all the attention goes on the knockout games. Um, I think they've pro- probably got more of a chance than Barcelona have, um, and yeah, Juventus still looks a bit disjointed. So yeah, I'm quite interested in Sarri. I'm sure you know more than me that he he went in there and ditched his four three three and kind of took a step closer to the players he's got. But going more four three one two, didn't he, at the start of the season? I always wonder how that plays out with managers, whether uh, you gain or lose respect from players by sort of diverting from what you've always done in your career and what's got you to that point. I think that he was told very much like, if you want this job, then you have to sort of be a little bit more pragmatic. Don't be so philosophical and 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 hell bent on playing a certain way. At the same time, he was brought in to play a more courageous and beautiful style of football. I think what Juventus haven't really learned is that their midfield does not doesn't have the mobility to play the kind of football that they want to see and to be entertained by. You can't really have this exciting football when you've got, you know, like Matuidi and Khadira like in your midfield, and that's your starting duo. It, it's going to be difficult. Ramsey is in and out with injuries. Rabio, he's also in and out right now with injuries. It's not a midfield capable of really dominating the way that you possibly can with the likes of Kovacic, obviously, and Jorginho 
Um, and Napoli, he had a, pretty much every single player he wanted who can do that. So this will be the exciting one. But when it comes to Europe, I just look at what Zidane's doing with Valverde um, in midfield and Rodrigo up front and the fact that they lost a generational talent in Ronaldo and they're still, what, top at the table with level on points with Barcelona. When you watch that performance for 70 minutes against PSG, you thought they could dominate Europe. But then they do have those moments where then they obviously conceded. It would be exciting to see. But let's end up with the social question. South End manager Saul Campbell said he did not understand what world these guys are living in after his team lost 4-2 against Bristol Rovers. When have you thought players were on a different planet? Is that in a good or a bad way? I think in a good way. <laughs> I remember Barcelona's first game when they played Arsenal, when they had the Xavi, Messi, that era, the first 20 minutes of that. Physically as well as technically, they're on another planet. In a bad way, I sort of vaguely remember... Vias Boas at Chelsea, the last, his last game against <laughs> West Brom, against Roy Hodgson's West Brom at the time. And you know when you have that, that it's a cliche when you think the players are, don't want the manager anymore. But I remember feeling like that at the Hawthorns that, that day. Oh, I've, AVB, we miss him. I've got a player that Jeremy is certainly very familiar with. And you know the expression, he's in a world of his own, Theo Walcott. He is on planet Theo for most of the game, whistling along as he runs, the ball gets to his feet. It's like a foreign object. He doesn't know what to do with it. Falls over on his backside, stands up, smashes it in the far corner. How did that happen? I've never seen a player daydream so much. He, he really is in a world of his own. He is on his planet, planet Theo, <laughs> dozing through game. Well, it's funny you should mention Theo because uh, we've had a tweet come in from Joe and he says, when Theo Walcott said they just wanted it more than us and I could see that from the first minute after a 3-0 defeat at Crystal Palace in which he was captain. Yeah, another one of Theo's quotes was that Arsenal have been consistent in patches. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Very good. I mean... I would love to see him on Match of the Day. There's the big obvious one that's still playing now would be like Maro Balotelli he seems to live in a, his, own, his own universe. Um, I think on the pitch... I've never s experienced anything in sport or anything when you watch Lionel Messi play in real life. It really feels like you're watching. If you see him actually in the stadium, you feel it when he gets the ball. It's like there's like an energy that comes around the entire stadium and it's just so, so cool. But uh, it, I, I can't explain it. And he just does things. You don't understand how he's done it. Like mm. you, can't, you can't figure out how, how he's been able to do that. How can his first touch be, be that good that he knows he's going to nutmeg someone with that touch and then do all these bits and pieces? He's an absolute freak. We haven't it's... discussed the, the training clips. Did you see the goals he's been scoring in training? Oh, my God. I mean, it must be so demoralising to play against. And as good as he is uh, in real games, you must, you know, you forget... What is he like when the pressure's off in training? You know, it's a bit all, like... all quotes about him from other players who play with him. So, you, like the stuff he does in training, you wouldn't even, yeah. you can't even describe it. It's ridiculous. It's a bit like an elite golfer. You know, <laughs> shoots like sixty-six in tournament play, but then when they play a practice round, they're shooting like sixty or sixty-one. And it's like frightening. Some of the goals he was scoring just incredible. I agree. Six ban on door. Contact the podcast AFC Podcast at Telegraph.co.uk. We'll read out the best of what you send us. Subscribe to the podcast. Search for Telegraph Audio Football Club. Thanks to Joel Grove on the button and thanks to you, the listener. I'll talk to you again soon.